Good morning. Uh, my name is Wes, uh, one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm excited to see so many of you out. Thanks for, uh, again, making this a priority in your week. Um, it's a pleasure and real privilege to worship together in person. Again, uh, something we, I don't think we'll ever take for granted again. Um, I'm going to ask, if you will, uh, turn with me now to our passage we're going to look at today. We're going to do what we do each week. Look at a passage from God's Word. We'll talk about what it means, why it matters, and what we should do about it. And today we are in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, beginning at verse 1. If you want to look that up, Bible app, there are some Bibles uh, in the little baskets in front of you as well. And when you found that, if you're able, would you stand together with me as we read this passage? Sort of unique, uh, this passage today, structurally anyway, because really, although the passage is 12 verses long, the first two are really kind of like the meat of the passage, and the other 10 are all just kind of backstory explaining. But uh, you'll see what I mean in a minute. So uh, let's look at this together, Matthew chapter 14. Here we read this, at that time, this is the time when Jesus was visiting Nazareth, his hometown, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead, and that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and had put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because he had, they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. It's quite the birthday present. The king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me uh, just pray for us briefly, and then we'll uh, dive into this together. Spirit of God, we ask now that you would illumine the preaching of your word. Open up our eyes, our hearts, our minds to uh, see, hear, be touched, receive be transformed by what we hear and what we do in this time together in your word. Uh, you tell us that when you send out your word, it doesn't return void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. Oh, God, accomplish that purpose in each one of us today. And as I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. So, you are the Christ. The great Jesus Christ. Prove to me that you're no fool. Just walk across my swimming pool. Just, just do that for me, and I'll let you go free. Come on, king of the Jews. Some of you are smiling. I can tell you recognize that. If you don't know already, these are lyrics from Andrew Lloyd Webber's classic rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, and in particular, one of its songs here depicting an interaction that Jesus has with Herod right before he's put to death at the hands of the Romans. And yeah, 100%, this is fiction. It's, it's created dialogue in these lyrics. It's not scripture, but what I think that song, the lyrics of that song capture perfectly is the polar opposite response of Herod to Jesus then we saw the people from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth having in our passage last week. His response is like polar opposite on the other end. The, the, the people in Nazareth, if you, don't, if you remember or you weren't here, they wanted Jesus to be ordinary like them. And so they explain away his divine claims and miraculous works. But no, man, Herod, Herod wants a superstar. He, he, he's all in for this, which means he's very open for, for Jesus, uh, a wonder-working Jesus. And as we'll see from his interactions with John the Baptist, he's also fascinated with the spiritual. But as you'll also see from our passage today, Herod falls into a deep and equally disastrous ditch on the opposite side of the road from the people in Nazareth. In that, while he's open to Jesus' divinity, first of all, his understanding of Jesus isn't based in reality. 
And secondly, Herod, he wants a prophet, but he wants one that he can control. Which is just to say, Herod, his view of Jesus is mythological, the stuff of Greek gods and Marvel superheroes. And it's also editorial. That is, uh, God, in Herod's, uh, as Herod's own opinion, describes him. And the reason I think it's so important for us to look at this still today, spend time in this story in particular, is not so that you can score better on Jeopardy when the topic happens to be Herodian dynasty for 500, but because of this simple reason, kind of tying in what we looked at last week. For every Nazarene who, who you will find in the world today that will foreclose on a non-divine identity for Jesus, the reality is that the church is very often where you will find Herods who experience not identity foreclosure, but mistaken identity when it comes to Jesus. The church is very often the place where you find this, where people believing things of and for Jesus found nowhere in the Bible, and worshiping a God that in the end looks very much like an idealized version of themselves. The problem with that, as you'll see this morning, is this. When Herod finally meets the real Jesus, he's very disappointed. He's very disappointed. And, and as a result, he misses Jesus just as the people from Jesus' hometown did as well. And so with the hope that you and I would not make that same mistake ourselves, which would lead us ultimately to the same offense and unbelief as when we foreclose on Jesus' identity. I want to look at the passage that we've just read today very simply in two ways. We're going to talk about mythologizing Jesus and editing Jesus. Just those two things. Mythologizing and editing Jesus. So if you close your Bibles, Bible app, whatever it is, would you open it again to that passage? Matthew 14, beginning at verse 1. Follow along with me as we look at how all Herods tend to interact with God and the dangers of mistaken identity. Okay, so let's look first of all at mythologizing Jesus. Mythologizing Jesus. And just to kind of get us into this, let's try to answer a few simple questions maybe you had, and like, who is Herod the Tetrarch? Now that sounds like something out of like Jurassic Park or something like that. Uh, uh, what, what is that? Uh, and, and, and if you're familiar with the Gospels, maybe you've read these before, maybe you're even asking yourself, well, which Herod is this? <laughs> because if you've read the Gospel accounts, there seems to be like 37 different Herods. Maybe not that, but there's like a lot of different Herods, and it's kind of hard to tell which one exactly it is that we're talking about uh, and is being referred to. And I, I don't want us to get caught in the weeds here as we do this, but just kind of generally speaking, broadly speaking, uh, the Herod in our passage today is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, one of three sons and under-rulers of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, who was the King Herod from Matthew chapter 2, who the wise men came and visited him, and he found out about this birth of the King of the Jews. He had to put all the baby boys to death. He is the son of that Herod the Great. So each one of his sons were given kind of rulership over different parts of his kingdom. Herod Antipas was given rulership over Galilee, which was where Jesus did the majority of his work and earthly ministry, and then also Perea, which is where John the Baptist baptized and was preaching and teaching. So that's why when, when you hear about Herod Antipas, he's the one you hear about most often when we're talking about John and Jesus. But if you look now at verse 1, this is where Herod is now confronted with the very same claims and miraculous works of Jesus that the people of Nazareth were confronted with and wrestling with in our passage last week. And if we could just pause at that idea and step back and kind of look at this all together, I think big picture, what we're seeing now, both with last week's passage and what we're looking at today, is that everyone has to do something with Jesus when they're confronted with him. When they experience, when they encounter Jesus, Everyone has to do something with Jesus. you got to make some decision. I mean, there's that well-known C.S. Lewis quote, which maybe you're familiar with, but, but the point is, no one can respond with indifference to Jesus. And the reason is, as, as Lewis points out so simply, is because the things Jesus did and the claims that he made about himself don't permit you to. You, you haven't actually heard about Jesus if you have no response whatsoever to him. Uh, he's either 
The, someone who said the stuff Jesus said about himself is either crazy, he's lying, uh, he's a megalomaniac, or he's actually the son of God. He's one of those things, but, but either way, no one encounters Jesus and walks away shrugging their shoulders like, mm, that was interesting. You have to do something with Jesus. So last week, people of Nazareth, what they did when they encountered Jesus is they're just like, they reject him. They're like, he's crazy, he's lying, there's no way he can be what he's saying because we know him, we grew up with him. But now when you come to verse 2 of our passage, look there, now we see what Herod does with Jesus is he begins to mythologize him. What I mean by that is, unlike the people of Jesus' hometown who decide he can't be divine because of overfamiliarity with him, Herod very much accepts, no, Jesus is the one. He's performing all of these miracles and wonders that he's been hearing about. But as you see in this verse, rather than accept Jesus' claims about himself, Herod instead sees him as John the Baptist raised from the dead and come to haunt him. Now, as you heard the whole story about John, we kind of see like why he goes there. Like he kind of got good reason to some degree to come to that conclusion. He had unjustly put John to death. Um, many had believed that John was a prophet of God. Sounds like uh, Herod also had a very high view of John. And so now he thinks, I'm being punished for my crime. It, my, 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 it's like karma, it's whatever, it's come back to haunt me now. And John's raised from the dead that, that's the conclusion that he comes to when he hears about the claims and works of Jesus. Uh, Leon Morris rightly says this, Superstition and a bad conscience made a strong couple, leading to this curious affirmation. But whatever the reason, as I said, the miraculous works of Jesus lead Herod to mythologize Jesus, see him as some kind of like avenging, wonder-working zombie, John the Baptist, I don't know what, come back to, to haunt him. And, and that's how Herod reconciles all this miraculous stuff that he's hearing Jesus do with his conscience. It's, it's almost as if, for Herod, this is a scene right out of Dickens, A Christmas Carol. And, and John is like some Jacob Marley, come back from the dead to, to haunt an Ebenezer Scrooge. But as we dig in a bit deeper, we learn that along with being rightly terrified about this conclusion about Jesus... Herod is also intrigued and fascinated by Jesus. Some of that we learn by looking at Mark's parallel account of this same story in Mark chapter 6. If you remember last week I told you Matthew kind of tends to condense his accounts and other gospel writers sometimes go into a little bit more detail. So in Mark's account we learn that yeah, Herod, like, the way he interacts with John is he's, he's angry at him, he's mad about what he's saying, calling him out about this unlawful marriage. But while we're told Herodias, she, his wife, she wants to put him to death right on the spot, Herod instead puts him in prison. And we hear, and then Mark tells us this, he says, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, adding, and he kept John safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, yet heard him gladly. So, so to some degree, Herod has also mythologized John. We're kind of seeing a pattern here of how he interacts with these people come uh, as messengers of God. So that's, that's one of the ways we know that he's doing that. Secondly, even more than this, when we read Luke's account of this same interaction that we talked about as we began here, uh, where Jesus is brought before Herod uh, by Pontius Pilate, sends him to Herod, and he has this interaction. There we read this. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he'd heard about him and was hoping to see some sign done by him. So Herod's got this totally mythologized, fabled kind of vision of who Jesus is because of what he's heard about him. But although, we read there, although Herod questions Jesus uh, at length, Luke tells us Jesus remained silent, made no answer, and certainly did no mighty work for Herod either. So taking all those pictures together, and now coming back to our passage in Matthew, that's what I mean when I say Herod, he feared Jesus, but he also was infatuated with him. He didn't see Jesus as God, no. But he mythologized Jesus, seeing him as a wonder-working superstar. And as we learned from Luke's account, he was hoping now to be able to kind of get a, a, an in-person performance of Jesus' traveling show. When you think of that idea and we try to transfer it in today, like, no, I've never heard anybody encounter the claims and miraculous works of Jesus and... and 
see him as some kind of powerful avenging zombie. What I do still hear people doing all the time, all the time, is mythologizing Jesus in all kinds of different ways, very much like what Herod did. You hear that all the time when people encounter the claims and the miraculous works of Jesus. Just as some examples, some of us, you, you hear about this or you see it a lot in movies, treating uh, crosses, um, paintings, statues of Jesus as though they in themselves have some kind of power to heal or protect you. Um, you, you see it when, um, for others when we treat prayers for healing or protection or provision like a combination lock. Like if I could just say the right words, if I use enough, like maybe a, a King James language or get worked up emotionally enough, then God will respond properly to my prayer. Um, you see it when people believe Jesus is more pleased with me today because I had my quiet time this morning. This is going to be a good day. Nothing's going to happen today because I, I did the right, I checked the right boxes today. You even see it in something as simple as the sinner's prayer. That kind of repeat after me, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe I'm a sinner. Please forgive my sin. That, that prayer, we can even mythologize that prayer. Seeing it as some kind of like, I just speak back this incantation, even regardless of whether I have any actual faith in Jesus, and now Jesus has to save me. As though Jesus is looking down on this person saying, this person has no faith in me whatsoever. They don't even see need for forgiveness, but dang it, they said the right words. So we can mythologize Jesus in thousands of different ways just like that. But if you remember what we looked at last week in John's gospel, where he said that the claims and the works of Jesus that he lists in his gospel, he says they were written down so that we may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. That's why he wrote all these things down, why they're presented now for us to encounter, which means, here's the key, we can never separate the miraculous works of Jesus from the claims of Jesus. They, they go together. And whenever we do, whenever you or I try to separate them, just like Herod, we end up developing a mythologized picture of Jesus that's completely separate from who he actually claimed to be. It might look really nice, it might look powerful, it might be very comforting to you, but in the end, it's still a mistaken identity of Jesus. Okay, so that's mythologizing Jesus mythologizing him again. It's a result of focusing on the miraculous works of Jesus and ignoring the claims of who he actually said he was. But the opposite can also be true. And just as damaging to seeing Jesus as he truly is, and no, I don't mean focusing on the claims of Jesus and ignoring the miraculous works. What I mean is kind of when we're not all that clear on what Jesus claims about himself to begin with, or seek to block out or ignore claims of Jesus that make us uncomfortable, both of which will just as easily lead to mistaken identity when it comes to Jesus as well. So that's the last thing I want to look at together with you now. Editing Jesus, what I'm calling just editing him. And while, no, you don't see Herod in our passage here, you don't see him explicitly doing this for Jesus, you absolutely see a pattern of editing God's words or the parts he doesn't like out, which is undoubtedly what contributed to his disappointment when he finally met the real Jesus. You see his pattern of doing this, and the pattern you see particularly is how he responds to John the Baptist. John the Baptist's very public kind of rebuke of his marriage to Herodias. Very quickly, the, the story, as history records it, is that one day Herod Antipas, he'd gone to Rome to visit his half-brother Philip, there he meets his wife, Herodias, falls in love with him. They fall in love together, and they decide to marry. But Herodias demands before that that he divorce his first wife, who was a Nabataean princess from a surrounding partner nation, a divorce that caused all kinds of political problems for Herod later, actually. But she demands, you, you must divorce her first. And, and while Jewish law absolutely permitted divorce. It was permitted. What you were not permitted to do was to marry his brother's wife while he was still alive. That in itself was considered, can't do that. That's why Herod had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. 
But if you look at verse 3 now, you see that rather than heed John's rebuke, listen to what he said, repent uh, of this action. Instead, Herod has John just put in prison. He just locks him away in order to ensure that neither he or anyone else has to hear this inconvenient truth. And yet, as we read in Mark's account, for some reason, he still wants to hear John, though. He still wants to hear him preach. He's, he's fascinated by him, and he's interested in what he has to say. So it's kind of like, I'm going to lock away that part. I don't want to hear that, but I do want to hear everything else, right? Uh, uh, I'm, uh, that, that's how Herod seeks to interact with John, and that's a pattern you see of, of editing as it relates to when God's word is delivered through his prophets to Herod. That's how he tends to edit out the message. Herod doesn't like what God has to say about something. He just edits it out. He mutes it while still trying to maintain everything else that he wants to hear from God. And although it's probably uncomfortable, I, I, my guess is that might sound familiar to a lot of us, maybe all of us. It's probably not surprising. I probably don't need to illustrate and, and describe to you how we do that exact same thing all the time in our lives whether it relates to who Jesus truly is. So, so we edit and, and create a picture of Jesus in our minds that better conforms with who we want him to be. Or, as it relates to the teaching of Jesus, editing, it out, editing out the parts of him and, and what he's taught that are in conflict with something that I want to do or, or, or the parts that I don't want to do, I just kind of edit it out. I mean, a classic kind of obvious example of this is the Jefferson Bible. If you know this story about... Uh, uh, this, this is on display in the Smithsonian Museum of Natural American History in D.C. Uh, a Bible where apparently Thomas Jefferson, the third U.S. Pres president, literally cut out all the references to the miraculous and the resurrection from the New Testament. He just cut them out, and that became uh, his, his Bible that he wanted to use. That's a pretty obvious and like stark example, but there are, there are way more subtle yet equally destructive forms of doing the very same thing. When the Bible's teaching on ethics, how we, how we steward our money, um, human sexuality, end-of-life issues, when those come into direct conflict with whatever cultural viewpoint is currently held as unquestionable, or hey, like when we, when we realize that Jesus actually wants to be Lord over my life and my decisions and not just my divine bro. The result can be the exact same. We can be tempted to cut out, shut down, lock away those parts of Jesus, those parts of his words that call us out. And in the end, the result is just the same as Herod. We miss the real Jesus in the editing process. And to be as fair as possible, 100%, sometimes what looks like editing you watch and you're kind of like, man, I'm, am I doing that? You see other people doing it. What looks like editing can be as a result of just genuine ignorance. Like I just actually don't I, don't, I don't, I don't know what the Bible says about who Jesus is, so I just don't know. That can, that can happen. I don't know what Jesus taught, so it's, it's, that's a real thing. So it looks like editing, but really it's just as a result of ignorance. And yet, seriously, a, a, along with that, far too often that ignorance can end up becoming over time an excuse for just not putting in the time and effort to find out what the Bible actually teaches about those things. It's just always responding with, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure what the Bible says about that, but I, I just think, fill in the blank, as though there was no way for you to possibly find out what the Bible teaches about that, and as though your opinion about it is actually more important than what the Bible actually reveals about it. But as I said when we began, the problem with either mythologizing Jesus or editing Jesus is that in every case, it leads not to identity foreclosure, but to mistaken identity. So much so that like Herod, when we finally come to meet the real Jesus, it's very disappointing. We, we just don't recognize him. We don't know what to make of that Jesus at all. With a sad ultimate result, just like Herod, just like the people of Nazareth, we miss Jesus, even though he's, he's right there in front of us. We, we miss him. I mean, Jesus himself describes such a mistaken encounter in Matthew 7, that terrifying passage 
describing the final judgment where Jesus says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Or perhaps in light of our passage today, maybe, maybe more like, you never actually knew me. And yet the incredible, glorious reality is that mistaking the real Jesus for an edited, mythologized version of him in your mind is never an inescapable or unavoidable reality or result for anyone. That never has to be the result for any of us. Again, because we have the picture of him right for us, given to us. We've got it right here. Again, remember, John said in, in, in the end of his gospel, saying that he says these, right, like this, this account of Jesus' claims, what he said about himself, his miracles. He says, I wrote these all down so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. This, this, this picture we have of Jesus here, who the Apostle Paul tells us, that in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. We have a perfect picture of what God's like by looking at Jesus. Apostle Paul tells us that in Hebrews we're told God has spoken and revealed himself directly and supremely to us through Jesus, who is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. We've got the picture right here. You and I have the clearest, most beautiful picture possible, apart from Jesus like standing physically in front of us right now, of what God is like, of, of, of what he requires of us, of, of who he is, what he, his character. We have the most beautiful, clear picture possible right here in God's word. And my question for all of us that, that we all need to really consider and ask ourselves is, are we making use of it? Are we checking and referring back to and learning and digging into the picture, the clear picture that's been given to us in God's word. I mean, in one sense, you're already doing it. You're doing it right now. Uh, as we come and gather and sit under the teaching of, of God's word, that, that's, that's part of how we do this. And, and my promise to you parents in here is that Dave and Courtney are doing that exact same thing. They're bringing a faithful teaching and, and preaching of, of how God's revealed himself to your kids as well. That, that's our commitment. That's because the word of God is one of our core values. We see the true picture of Jesus and what God's like, and that's why that's the focus of what we do here. But are you pursuing more of that picture yourself as well? Are you pursuing it? Or are you relying on others to do the work for you so that this picture of who God is and what he's like opens up on Sunday and we come and gather together and then it doesn't open again until next week when you come back? If your understanding of who Jesus is, what the Bible teaches about something, if it's mistaken, if you've mythologized a part of Jesus, if you edited out a part of what he's like, that's, and which we're all prone to do, myself included, we're all prone to do that, are you also seeking to correct that? correct that mistaken identity because think about this in, in everyday life when we experience mistaken identity most if not all of us after recognizing that we've done it and recovering from the embarrassment we, we seek to correct the the mistake don't we if you've been experienced mistaken identity you seek to correct it when you do that in everyday life I still have this vivid picture of, of myself I'm like three or four years old I was in a crowded bank and walked up, because I was a little bit terrified, walked up and grabbed my dad's hand, only to look up and realize I'd grabbed some stranger's hand. Um, what I didn't do in that moment was think, well, you know what? It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of effort to find where my actual dad is. I think I'm just going to stick with the hand I grabbed. Hey, dad. No, right? You, 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 you call out, you, you ask, you seek. You seek to find the truth because you realize I've made a mistake. So too with you and I when it comes to Jesus. May each one of us, all of us together, collectively and individually, continue to press into this word to discover the true picture, the truest picture possible of God, who he is, what he's like, what he expects of me. So that, two things, I'll have the original with which to compare all the counterfeits that I come up with through mythologizing and editing. I'll have a real picture 
of the original to compare those counterfeits with. And so much more than that, so I don't miss the real Jesus and in so doing, miss the salvation he came to freely give. The salvation in his name, in him alone. Not the edited version, not the one that I create that sounds good to me. The true picture, that's where salvation is found. And then along with that, that's essential for us. So too is it essential for living out our mission and vision as a church. Because it's only when we see and believe Jesus for who he truly is ourselves, well, that we're then able to present a true and saving picture to the city and world around us. May God give us eyes to see the importance of this, to see him for who he truly is and to welcome him and love him and continue to seek more of who he truly is. For it's a truly a beautiful picture and it's clearly laid out for us right here in his word. Amen.